I'll be speaking in the next 15 minutes on value of bone turnover markers in osteoporosis. As you know, the burden of osteoporosis is uh, significant. And uh, the main reason is the population is aging. Around 200 million women are affected worldwide. And the amount spent is around 37 billion uh, uh, euros. Actually, that's what has been spent in uh, 2010 in European Union. And in India, more than 46 million Indian women over the age of 50 are affected. And these are all the most of the cost of osteoporosis are accounted by fractures. So what is the future? It is said that by 2025, you will have around more than 1,200 million people, more than 60, having osteoporosis. And the estimated uh, expenditure is around 76.1 billion by 2050. However, there is a major challenge that is non-response to treatment. So these are the various studies. But they found that 50% patients stop therapy after 12 months. Why? Because complex dosing regimens, undesirable side effects, lack of visible benefit of the osteoporosis therapy. And non-response to treatment can also be caused by a suboptimal response to the prescribed therapy, bioavailability, low diet calcium intake, vitamin D insufficiency. So there are some unmet needs, that is non-compliance and non-response to therapy. Uncertainty is with respect to duration of treatment and provision of a drug holiday, lack of appropriate monitoring tool, and you don't have a single test to accurately identify the risk of fracture. The, currently, DEXA is a gold standard, but then what it does, it provides quantitative data. There's no assessment of microarchitecture. It's a static measure. 50% of women who sustain osteoporotic fracture do not have a BMD in the osteoporotic range. Now, you want to see the response. You have to be picked up within the next six months. So that's the reason you have to wait for more than at least a year to find out. Poor quality of DEXA may result in expensive, unnecessary, and potentially harmful clinical decisions. It's expensive, limited availability. A little bit about bone turnover markers. This is the classical description of bone remodeling by frost. So it begins with resorption by the osteoclast. Then you have a reversal. And then you have formation by the osteoblast. And then you have the resting phase. So once you're attained the peak bone mass, then what happens is there is a gradual decline. So the peak bone mass happens by around the, the end of uh, puberty, by which time the maximal accrual of bone mineral density happens. A defect here can lead to osteoporosis, osteopetrosis, or Page's disease of bone. There are multiple bone turnover markers involved in formation and resorption, like your formation markers include the P1NP, that is pro-collagen type 1 amino terminal pro-peptide. You have the alkaline phosphatase, osteocalcin, bone resorption marker like CTX, that is carboxy terminal telopeptide of type 1 collagen, pyridinolin, deoxypyridinolin, TRAP, that is starter resistant acid phosphatase isoform 5B, and the NTX, that is the amino terminal clause linking telopeptide of type 1 collagen. But what is the reference one? Reference bone turnover marker. So the International Osteoporosis Federation and the IFCC says, a bone formation it is a P1NP, and for bone resorption, it is beta cross slabs or the CTX. Why? Because they are adequately characterized, clearly defined, bone specific, they perform well in predicting fracture risk and monitoring treatment, acceptable biological and analytical variability, uh, then ideally obtained from blood samples to help limit individual variation that may otherwise arise from measurement in urine. Measures in routine clinical laboratory are ideally using automated. So in them also, you can actually measure. Now coming to the utility of these markers. So in osteoporosis, so you can look into treatment monitoring of patients under therapy. You will know whether the drug is acting or not as early as three months. You can look for these beta cross labs P1 MP. Whereas you want to do a BMD, you have to wait for one to two years. You can enhance the patient adherence. I told you 50% stop treatment after 12 months. So find that the, the bone mineral markers are increased, bone turnover markers. You can tell them, yes, you are at high risk for fractures. So you can tell you must take this, otherwise you will get a fracture. So in How do you identify? So two things you must remember. There was a study known as a trio study. So this included a formal assessment of two treatment strategies. One is the least significant change. The least significant change can be considered to be significant based on two measurements in an individual. Number one, the level should be around 10 microgram per liter for P1NP and 120 nanogram per liter for CTX. 
So you must see that there should be a variable. I'll give some examples in the later part. Then you must know the median value of the bone turning in a healthy young woman. That is a pre term person. This is useful if only one bone turn measurement documented while on treatment. If the BTM is below the premenopausal median yield, then the patient is considered to have responded. For example, these numbers are 35 micrograms per liter for P1 NP and 280 nanograms per liter for CTX. Suppose you had a person who had 400 uh, uh, was the CTX. You started on treatment. It came to around 200. Patient has responded because it has come below that thing. And is it more than 120? Yes, it is more than 120. Because from 400, it came to, uh, say, 250. It's more than that 120 change. Similarly, suppose you had a P1NP, which was, say, around uh, 100. And then you started on treatment. It came down to now 20. Is it below the, it's below the detectable range? Yeah, 35, yes. And the decrease was more than 10, yes. So that's how you decide. So these are the expected values in osteoporotic patients versus LDS subjects. So you can see in the premenopausal, the mean is around 40, 31. And in the osteoporotic, it's 54. Men, once again, it's around 38. So you can see these expected values in healthy women. There is no significant change in serum CTS concentration with age in premenopausal women. They continue to be roughly around this range only. Uh, from as low as 0 0.21 to 0 0.38 micrograms or around 271 nanogram per liter. We have studied it in the Indian population also from CMC value. Yeah, not so much difference here, yeah, but then they are matching premenopausal women having uh, a better uh, response compared to that of postmenopause. Coming to monitoring for anti-resorptive and anabolic treatments, say utility. You can indicate therapy success and monitor treatment compliance. So you started with a placebo, you gave them ibandronate. Within 12 weeks, you see that the levels have come down, the beta cross lab, that is the CTX. You stop it, it rises. Similarly, for osteocalcin, you treat, came down, stop it, it improved. Uh, so the patient achieving the greatest reduction in the bone turnover markers demonstrate the largest improvement in BMD. So here you can see, uh, 833 postmenopausal women treated with once weekly bisphosphonates. The women who achieved the greatest reduction in BTMs, the highest turtle at three months, had the largest mean increase in BMD measured at 24 months. And those who had the least had the worst response at 24 months. Coming to how do you enhance the patient adherence? I told you before itself. See, as early as three months, you can find that the least significant change is overcome. That's because you get a 30 to 300% change within three months of therapy. BMD, this 2 to 5% change because at least more than one and a half to two years. And that's the reason we measure. Exceptions include post hyperpara therapy or post uh, uh, cushions. So I'll just give an example of BMD versus uh, bone turnover markers. Suppose you are driving from A to B. This trip takes two years. And there are no signs or signals where whether you're on the right way, unless you have an accident. Bone markers are like signals, example, a GPS or a signpost on the road to show you after a few months already that you're on track with your therapy. So that is how it is. Early monitoring, anti-resorptive, it came down, you can see by three months. For anabolic, we should see the increase in the bone turnover markers because you are increasing, the bone formation marker starts increasing. So the P1NP, you should look for this, including the CTX. Bone formation will start increasing first, and then the CTX. So this is an anabolic window. So once it starts becoming nearer, that means we say now we should, that's a time that to tell you that, yeah, probably, yes, you have to start the, the action of uh, uh, anabolic therapy is coming to an end. So I told you the positive P1NP response were defined by more than micrograms per micrograms per uh, liter. If it is the P1 LP are identified non-responders, that is an increase less than they are non-responders. Okay, so what are the differences bone turnover markers versus BMD? So here you use uh, uh, an instrument, of course not much of radiation. Bone turnover markers, blood or urine sample collection, non-invasive. You can repeat it frequently here probably only after a year or so exceptions. More expensive is BMD, cheaper, 
expected change time and size of signal in response to therapy six to eight percent within a year 20 to 300 percent within three to six months methodology is actually more robust with amds whereas uh, btms it's the so this is what the same thing the noise change here coming to algorithms and guidelines what do you do how do you monitor osteoporosis therapy so get a baseline btm p1 np and ctx start them on treatment monitor once again btm decrease less than the least significant change find out what is the reason reassess treatment poor complaints other issues btm inc decreases more than the least significant change the patient is responding continue the treatment this is an absolute change 10 in different different studies 10 micrograms and 100 it crossed that median should be below that mean i told you less than 35 and less than 280 you found that 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 means the patient is responding so response i told you changes greater than the least significant change results that exceed an absolute target and reduction to a level below the median found in the healthy young women this is the sheffield algorithm one month you do a compliance check. Six months, once again, P1 and P check response. Five years reassess factor risk using DEXA. Consider pause in treatment. What do you mean by positive response? Decrease by more than 10. Decrease to less than 35 micrograms. So anabolic, you look for the increase. It should be at least more than 10 or increase to more than 16. And that is the upper limit of normal the cutoffs of P1 and P. So I'll just end by two cases. 70-year-old women, osteopenia noted in spinal radiographs. She was treated with alendronate 70 mg once weekly, calcium, vitamin D. At that time, the BMD was minus 3 at the hip and spine. They were measured at baseline and after 6 months, she took alendronate for 5 years. Then he stopped it. They were measured once again after 1 year. So a baseline 560. 6 months, 120 and 20. 60 months, same, 120 and 20. He stopped it now. It increased. 440. Did the patient respond to treatment? Has the treatment effect more now? She responded initially because from 400, it came down to 280. It, below this 280 range, it came down to 120. I told no. So the decrease was more than 120. Yes. And it fell below the median of the young healthy adults. Yes, it happened. So it was below that. For T1 and did she respond? Did the decrease by more than 10? Yes. Did it fall below the premenopausal range of 34 micrograms per liter? Yes. And then after stopping, there was an offset. Now, did it increase by more than 80? Yes. It has gone up to 400 now. And what about PNP? Did it increase from 20? It became 40. Increase was more than 10. It went above the premenopausal range, 35. So telling that she did respond, but then now after stopping, it has increased. Phase 2, 87-year-old women, previous fracture, multiple fractures, L3, L4, treated with alendronate, 70 mg once weekly for 10 years, stopped two years ago. She is using calcium and vitamin D alone. A vertical fracture assessment reveals a fracture at L2. Now, after this is after uh, 10 years. There's another fracture at L2. Work of a secondary cause of osteoporosis negative. Of course, at 87, we'll not think about that. Her P1 NP is 140. What is the interpretation? Line of action. So now, because it is 140, it should have been less than 35. That means patient is no longer having suppression of bone turnover from prior allendronic therapy. She has a high bone turnover. Probably we should give instead of allendronic, probably a zolendronic or a dedazumab. Can you use anabolic? Yeah, maybe. But the only thing is, if you use first allendronic followed by uh, an anabolic, they don't respond well. So that is one. Uh, is she a non-responder? No, it's not. When you say non-responder, when you have more than two fractures during the treatment period. To summarize, BTMs are a useful tool in the monitoring therapy of osteoporosis and improving patient adherence to therapy. P1 and P, CTX bone resorption, uh, reference bone turnover markers uh, uh, recommended by the IFCC and IOF. The BTMs are affected by sources of biological and analytical variability, feeding, Circadian rhythm, CKD, steroid therapy being important ones. Many can be controlled or worked around. The response to treatments and adherence can be approved with BTMs earlier than with BMD as early as three months after startup therapy. Appropriate tar treatment targets for BTMs using least significant tools and reference intervals have been developed to help identify patients with poor compliance and non responding A number of guidelines have been developed to BTMs in the management of osteoporosis in clinical practice. 
Thank you for patient hearing.